Ryan, welcome. We made it. We are in episode four of the Ask Anything Quattro. series. Quattro. We've been having a lot of fun and I'm excited for today. Today's theme, as you'll find out, this is that opportunity for you to have coffee with your pastor. And so I encourage you, if you're in a safe environment uh, near a nice chair or a sofa, grab a cup of coffee, sit down. We're going to get into some real practical things. We're going to talk about prayer day. We're going to talk okay. about um, our discipleship to Christ through uh, spiritual disciplines such as reading scripture and how to allow scripture to renew our minds and what that looks like. And then we're even going to talk about demon possession out of all things and maybe <laughs> how that ties into some of this. So we're just going to hop right in and we're going to kick it off with the first question, which is talking about that the Bible says that we're new creations. And this particular person said that they, they feel like because of past struggles, they don't necessarily feel like a new creation. Mm -hmm. And so even after sitting and trying to have the Bible saturate their mind and meditating on scripture, they want to know like, how do we enter into the process of truly allowing scripture to transform us, renew our minds and to become a new person? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, so a few things there. First, first thing I would, would say to someone or to the person asking this Feeling like you're not new while the Bible tells you you are new is a lifelong Christian reality. Oof. So, good. you know, it's funny this question gets asked actually right here, right now today. I was with a handful of pastors yesterday and we read a book together. Mm. And so we meet once a month and we were talking about uh, the dark side of leadership and the dark side of narcissism. And there's a book by Chuck DeGroat called When Narcissism Comes to Church. Mm. <laughs> and so we were tasked as, as pastors to read that together and talk about how, much of, how a bunch of narcissists we are <laughs> and how we need God's mercy and transforming work in our lives. And one of the things that I mentioned you know, to the group is I just like, man, this is so hard. Like narcissism, when, when talked about this way, is something that so many of us struggle with. It's basically this self on steroids was what one of the pastors said. It's this just self-preoccupation. A lot of people think it's self-aggrandizement, which it, it is, but it can also be um, just a lack of self-acceptance even. So you find yourself in tremendous despair all the time because you're constantly thinking about yourself. So basically focused on self-reference, being very self-referential. And so we were talking about this, and I have a point to this, sorry, I know I'm meandering. But in the part of the process, I mean, this is lots of pastors, even some, you know, up in their 70s and one of them, very, very wise sage, just said, you know what, gentlemen, like, I think maybe one of the things we have to think about in this subject with this sin and parts of our life we know are not yet conformed to the image of Christ, that aren't fully renewed to the way the scriptures speak that they should mm. be, is instead of living with despair or angst or frustration or tension about that, we should live with hope and longing mm. that Jesus is going to rescue us. He is going to finish the work. He is going to transform our lowly bodies and give us a glorified body. Yeah. And in the time being, we are called to go from glory to glory. Second Corinthians 3, 18, off the top of my head, if I can remember it, it says, we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of God move from glory to glory, strength to strength. This is something the Spirit does in us. The Spirit does this work in our lives. And so we need to behold the glory of God. And I think that's part of it. I think the, the the question here of I feel struggles in my life, even though I'm a new creation, how does this happen? I'd say you need to behold the glory of God. You, you have to consistently keep your heart and your mind um, before the majesty, the beauty, the wonder, the incredible reality of Christ mm. uh, crucified and risen for your salvation. And you need to saturate your mind on that truth. And the truth is you are a saint yeah. in Christ, that your status in Christ, not because of how you performed today, not because of how little or how much you sin today, mm. your status as saint, righteous, justified in Christ, this is a theological truth about your identity now because of faith, period. Mm. But we all feel our way forward or backward in our progress or lack thereof, uh, even though the way we we are reformed and shaped is through meditation of scripture, beholding the glory of God, worship, prayer, practices. Yes, there's just this tension from the outset we have to live with, which is I don't believe anyone in this life is going to spiritual practice their way to perfection. Yeah, It's actually not going to happen. Now, the hard part is, is when people hear that, they might think, well, then who cares? 
well, that, no, 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 no. There's too much joy and too much good. And yeah. God's life he has for us is too wonderful to not pursue it. But we also got to recognize that this work of salvation God has started in us and he has promised he'll finish in us. Philippians 1, 6, I'm confident of this, that he who began this work in me will carry it to completion upon the day mm. of Christ Jesus' return. Or uh, I believe this is in Thessalonians, the Lord has delivered us, he is delivering us, and he will one day finally fully deliver us. Those things are all illustrating that progression of spiritual development and formation in the Christian life. It starts with being born again. It starts with being justified by faith, being made as if you'd never sinned, even though you still sin. So you're a saint who still struggles with sin. So you must, on one hand, accept that you are beloved of God as you are because of Christ's performance. And then you must surrender and behold the glory of God with an unveiled face through practices of pursuit that conform your life to the increasing image of Christ, glory to glory, and never get despairing that you're not where you wish you ought, you could be or you should be, but but recognize you're further along than you were. Yeah. And then also recognize that God is the one who's going to carry this broken flesh across the finish line yep. and give us, should we die or he return first, a brand new glorified body with only desires that honor the Lord mm -hmm. in a new heavens and a new earth and a kingdom to come. And so until then, we're all works in progress. So I guess I want to say like, as a pastor to this person sitting across mythical coffee, I don't, I don't have any, I have just a little bit of water, barely, a little bit of water, barely should have left. prepared. Better. I know. <laughs> what I want to say is, yeah, yeah. Like as your pastor, I want to say, yeah, you're going to have days you feel like I am a chief of sinners. Mm -hmm. And not just days, seasons. Yeah. Paul says that I am the worst of sinners. Paul says in Romans seven, I don't do what I know I should do. And then I, uh, do what I should not do. And he says, who will save me from this wretched body of <laughs> death? Oh, but Christ will. Yeah. And, and so there's therefore now verse one of chapter eight, right after this plea of his broken sin reality, yet this gift of Christ's righteousness, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. How liberating we, we, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling from the gifted position of righteousness as a saint in Christ mm -hmm. because of Christ, not because of us. Yeah. And this is a lot of a reform doctrine. I think reform doctrine, doctrines of grace, this is one of the areas that, that that stream or system, I think, has a lot to offer us mm -hmm. to recognize this imputed, this, this gifted righteousness that I receive, I don't earn or perform, is my status. Mm. It is my driver's license. It's my passport. It's my social security card. It is, it is my identity. But then I sometimes live up to it or under it. And I'm, we're all living under it in a long scope. And we're being slowly but faithfully reformed and remade and refashioned. So there's real progress in the Christian life. Yeah. But there's never perfection in the Christian life until death or Christ returns, until mm -hmm. glorified bodies. That should keep us all really humble yeah. and really hungry. Yeah. And that's really the better question, right? The better question, I think, than despairing over, in my opinion, how come I'm not where I should be? I just want to ask you two things. Are you humble? Is, do you have increasing humility in your life? Mm. And if you do, know that that's the Spirit of God working. Mm. And are you hungry? Are you hungry for the word? Are you hungry for prayer? Are you hungry to walk with Jesus? Are you hungry to obey the spirit? You're going to miss it. You're not going to do it perfect. Mm. But if you've got humility and hunger, mm. I think that's what Jesus is attracted to anyway. Look through the gospels. Yeah. He was put off mm -hmm. by the religious self-righteous performers who thought they were nailing their, their morning devotions mm -hmm. and crushing their Christian obligations and, and beating everybody out in their, perfect spiritual practices. Yep. Jesus was attracted to the humble and the hungry. Yeah. And so the way we stay um, in a beholding transformative posture towards the image and transformation of Christ is we stay humble and we stay hungry. And we'll get more specific. There are practices yeah, there. Yeah. But again, I just want to say like this question is really good because I we all relate to it. 
Yes, you're struggling. Mm -hmm. Yes, you feel like your struggles are still a reality. Welcome to the reality of the Christian life. Yep. You don't outgrow that. In fact, the closer you get to God, and in a lot of ways, the more progress you make, the more humble you become, the more aware you become that even in your good deeds, even in your, I served someone, a lot of what did that or motivated that was the false self, yeah. uh, that, that narcissist dark side that did it in a lot of ways to feel good about yourself. Yep. And God's trying to deliver us from that. Like, yep. so, so growth is the vision of the Christian life, but we also got to understand, especially in the American West, self-improvement um, culture. Yeah. That, that in itself can be a miss. And so I, I think the better questions to ask ourselves is, am I growing in humility and am I growing in hunger yeah. so for the presence of God, the person of God and the mission of God? And if, I, if those things are happening in my life, I think I'm probably moving more towards conformity to Christ, yeah. right? Hum, humility, hunger, maybe one more, like service towards others. If, if I'm humble in my disposition of who I am in, in, in my life, if I'm hungry for the Lord, and if I'm, if I'm growing in service, right, selflessness, service of others, then, then, you know, that's actually how I think our minds are getting renewed. Yeah. You know, that's kind of the map in my mind. Yeah. And I think it's important to, to debunk something. And that is just this terrible game of comparison we love to play. Yeah. And it's, it is prevalent even more so now with how exposed we are to technology and just being able to see into others' lives. But even through my friendship with you, and I'm inspired with your inspired by your walk with God, like not every morning that you get up and you relax in your bathtub and light sure. your candles and open your Bible. <laughs> no every, candles. No candles. All right. <laughs> no candles. But not every morning that you do that, yeah. does God show up in this crazy way? Totally. Sometimes it's just the consistency of totally. showing up and, and allowing your mind to be renewed that leads to breakthrough. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to remember, I read a really fascinating tweet or article on this. It was a couple of years ago. It stunned me at first. It almost took me back. I was kind of like, oh, I don't know that I like that. <laughs> but it basically said, the Bible doesn't tell you anywhere to read your Bible every day. Oh, what? <laughs> like, wait a minute. Like, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but, but this thing, just, just real quick, do we have plenty of examples from church history? Do we have pragmatic, like, uh, instruction from church fathers and rules of life and Benedictine monasteries yep. and different iterations of the, the, the Christian movement through the last 2000 years that, that show us that faithfully, consistently daily soaking our hearts and minds in scripture and prayer practices are good. Yes. But I do just want to remind everybody, show me the verse. Show me the verse of the Bible that says every day what it means or <laughs> is you, need to be, you need to read me every day. What you're going to see more is like hide this in your heart. Obey these precepts. Abide. Abide in me, Jesus mm -hmm. will say. Um, pray. Right? So the, the kind of like Western, like modern thing, we've kind of like people that have been Christianized, it's like... Am I in my little Bible reading plan every day? I'm not down on a Bible reading plan. I think it's very good. I think it's very practical. Helps me read my Bible. If I didn't have one, I think I would struggle. I'm not. I'm just trying to point out. We we so quickly attach our Christian growth to our performance to a track or a plan, mm -hmm. which is so American. And I, and I, you know, I had a friend, a pastor friend, asked me one time. He just said, "Let me ask you a question. If you walked up to Jesus in the first century and said, how's your spiritual life going?'" How's your spiritual growth? He would like, he would like look at you and be like, <laughs> huh? Like it wouldn't really count. It wouldn't, it wouldn't hit the same way. Cause for us, we have a very fragmented approach to spirituality. So we have our quiet time. We have our church time. We have our small group time, but then we have a rest of our life where we do all the other things. And then we at times feel guilty about those things. And we're like, I got to do more of the Jesus things, more of the spiritual things. And that's actually a really dualistic approach to spirituality. Um, a much more integrated approach is recognizing that like my eating, my sleeping, my living, my romancing, my recreating, my working, all of those things are done unto the glory of God for the good of his kingdom and the disciple making of myself and other people. Mm -hmm. And so in all those things, I invite God in and I learn to live his way. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there are some practices of stilling our hearts and our minds lifting our hearts to God in prayer, soaking our souls in scripture. At some point 
you have to read the Bible or else you're not going to know the target. Yeah. You're not going to know who God is, who you are and, and what his standard is yeah. and what his vision is for your life. But we can make spiritual growth plans, spiritual development plans, their own versions of legalism or uh, their own versions of self-salvation or self-significance where we are proving to people uh, or ourselves that we're good. Mm. And, and I, so I just want to help this person who's asking this question. I do care about it quite a bit. Being like grown humility, growing hunger, growing service. Mm. There's a lot of things you're going to put into your life. It's going to look in a lot of di- little different unique rhythms, that different than Sean, different than Ryan. But as you do that, measure those things. You know, it's kind of like for me, I'm, I'm riffing now. I'm off your notes, but you'll get back to them. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't care. I don't give a rip how many people attend Trope Church over the next 10 years. I don't care. I don't care how big our church gets, how medium size it gets, how small it gets. I care about three things. I want to see a thousand people profess faith in Christ and get baptized in water. I want to see 500 people graduate a three-year, multi-year, multi-phased, intentional spiritual formation pathway called retrain. Um, And I want to plant at least three churches. I want to multiply the deposit of God's grace in our church through trained and and called leaders to multiply church planting. That's what I want to do over the next 10 years. And if we do that, then I think that's the measure God's given us, our re3 vision. That's what faithfulness and success looks like. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like is whatever, whatever programs, whatever events, however many people, however little people, I don't care if we shrink or, or we grow. What I care about is those benchmarks. Okay. In the same way, in the spiritual life, I think we need to say, I care about this. Is there more humility? Is there more hunger for God? And is there more Christ like service towards those in my orbit? My wife, my kids, my church, my job, my community. If that's happening, that means that the other things are getting you there. Mm-hmm. And those things are, they are, they are Bible reading, yeah. they are prayer, they are silence and solitude. They are obedience. They are submission. They are service. Those practices are the, to use a business term, they're the lead measures that you should be measuring the leg measures, which is a heart of humility, a heart of hunger for this presence and purpose of yeah. God and a service towards God's kingdom. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of just some thoughts. Oh, I love that. So as we're talking about reading our Bibles, one thing that you pick up on, and even in the beginning of Genesis, you get this idea that there is this, this God. Mm-hmm. And then as we read the story further, we get introduced to two more characters, <laughs> and that is Jesus, and then thirdly, the Holy Spirit. This concept isn't blatantly mentioned in the Bible. We don't use the word Trinity. Yeah. Now, there's Trinitary Trinitarian ideas that we see all throughout scripture unpack that a little further from us. Like how do we, how do we come to the point where now we have this word Trinity that describes the relationship of our, of our God? Yeah, it's a good question. The question I know we're looking at, can you explain why the church believes in the Trinity and the church does has confessed this, this is super Orthodox, like to not believe father, son and spirit co-equal in value essence um, and personhood, but different in their distinction of function would amount to, in my mind, heresy, like full blown heterodox, not sound teaching. The church has confessed this for, for 2000 years. Um, but the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but just because a word is not in the Bible doesn't mean the concept the word is encapsulating Mm. is not truth. So, uh, I mean, we just talked about it with Bible reading, right? Right. Like Bible reading isn't in the Bible, right? (laughs) Exactly. Or like, don't look at porn, like isn't in the Bible, (laughs) but like, we, what we do know is in the Bible. We're dating. Right. Yeah, exactly. But what we do know is in the Bible is a vision for sexual ethics and purity of heart and standard of conduct and behavior mm-hmm. that would make pornographic engagement outside of the realms of responsible and ethical Christian behavior. So that's, I just, the first thing I want to say to this question is like, just because the word or the doctrinal, the doctrinal uh, title the word doctor means teaching. So just because the title of the teaching isn't in the scripture doesn't mean the concept of the teaching is not replete in the scripture. That's good. And that is the scenario yeah. with Trinity, with Father, Son, and Spirit. Um, this is true because you see it at the very beginning of the Bible. The Spirit hovers over the face of the water in Genesis chapter 1. Obviously, the Father or God is speaking, and there's creative acts occurring. Colossians tells us in the New Testament that it is... the 
Christ, the Logos, the Word of God, that is Jesus is, is present, the Son of God, rather, is present upholding creation. We see in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We see Jesus say to Thomas, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, we see in Matthew 28, 19, uh, Jesus says in the previous verse, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, I say to you, go and make disciples, baptizing them uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. I am with you to the very ends of the age. That's the Trinity, right? Yeah, there. I believe that's actually verses 18 through 20 of chapter 28. So the Trinity is just, that's what church history, church title um, has called this inescapable and repentant you know, clear doctrine, this clear teaching that God um, has presented himself as three equal persons, yet one God. Now, there's been doctrinal error on this subject, and I like to just nerd out a little bit for a second with people on this. Nerd the, out. The, one of the early doctrinal errors was Arianism, which was this idea of a descending Godhead or this idea that the Father made the Son and the Son made the Spirit. So almost like Jesus is like a demigod and borrowing, borrowing from like, like uh, polytheistic myth Greek mythology um, that was rejected by early church fathers. No, the father is not, you know, up here. And then there's a lesser God named Jesus and an even lesser God named Holy Spirit. That's false teaching. It's not true. Another doctrine that's been rejected is modalism. Hmm. And so this is the idea that um, God is one God, but he manifests himself as three manifestations and he's only one of those manifestations at a time, okay? So this would basically be something like, in the Old Testament, he was Father. And during the New Testament times, he was Jesus. Mm -hmm. And now, he's the Spirit. No, Jesus is co-equal with the Father and the Spirit. And the, Jesus, the Son, is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Spirit is indwelling you and me. So it's not like you can break apart the Trinity like that. This is yeah. hard for us to understand. It breaks our little minds, but that's a good thing. If you could fully understand the exact and every nuanced element of the nature of God, then you should have his job title, but you don't. <laughs> so he is Father, he is Son, he is Spirit, co-equal in power, glory, and essence, but distinct in function. And the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, is a community of love. It is a community of self, uh, selfless service to each other, um, and that's why we are made to love and why we're made for community and made for relationship because God is community and God is relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is, I, I believe that there's function to the Trinity. I believe there's order even to the Trinity. Um, this is a question. I'm just going to skip down to it. You might, you might, but someone oh, asked yeah, a question I liked, which was when we pray, how should we pray? Like, should we, is it okay to pray to the spirit or pray to Jesus? And I would say it's okay to pray to the Holy Spirit, pray to Jesus, co-equal um, persons in the Godhead. I do think the Bible, though, teaches us models for us to pray to the Father by the Son through the Spirit. So I think if you, if you, I don't think it's like wrong, I wouldn't get legalistic about it. But like, yeah, I mean, uh, I think the Bible instructs that we pray to the Father. That's how we're taught to do it. But I don't think that means you can't pray when you say God or Lord or Jesus or Spirit. I think all that's totally okay. Um, but that's a question I noted was on here. Yeah. Can, can you unpack that? So you, what you said was uh, pray to the Father. To through, the Father. To the Father, through the Son, yep. by, by the, the Spirit. Spirit. What does that mean? It means we're approaching... It, that, that is doctrinal. It doesn't mean that you can't... It, okay, it doesn't mean you can't say Jesus or Holy Spirit when you pray. I think what it's recognizing is that as we approach God, it's possible to approach this triune God because the Spirit is empowering us to do so. And Jesus has laid his life down and broken the veil mm. between, to use a model of Old Testament temple or tabernacle, where you could, in God's holiness, we could not access it. Yeah. So we're entering into a place of communing and conversating with the holy one and only God. And we're able to do that because the Spirit, it's by the Spirit through the work of the Son to the Father. The, the, the Bible just uses that language. The New Testament authors use that language. And so again, it's not something I think you should be legalistic about, but it's important to note. Yeah. I would suggest if you've never prayed to the Father, 
you should probably expand the vocabulary of your prayer life. Yeah, that's good. Maybe if you've never addressed the spirit in your prayer, you should probably expand the mm -hmm. vocabulary of your prayer life. If you only pray to Jesus, it's it's one it's one God, but it's three persons. So I just think, you know, in our praying, having them reflect who God is mm. um, indicates we're understanding that the Spirit is helping me do this. Jesus mm. is why I can do this. And I have a restored relationship with the Father, which is a wonderful, beautiful thing. Mm. So. Mm. With talking about the Trinity, that is the first model of community that we see in Scripture. Yeah. Uh, and so if it's by God's design, that means he was intentional with that, which mm -hmm. means that we're built for community. Yeah. And so that leads us to our next question, which is, you know, how do we build friends at church? And I love that they use the word friends, like just this idea that like church is fun, like because friends are fun. Yeah. And so what does it look like to build community at church? Mm -hmm. And how is community so vital to the, the growth of our faith that we were just discussing in that first question? Yeah, I, I don't think that Christianity is a solo sport. I just don't think you see that anywhere in the biblical text. Um, God isn't trying to make for himself um, he's, he's made for himself a people called the church, the bride, not just persons. Um, and I think there's a communal element there that does reflect the very nature of God himself. So some of this is theological again. Um, I know that that's just the way it is. It's, it's theology because our theology should inform this. But I also think the question, how do I build friends? How do I get friends and, and create friends at church? Uh, be a friend. You know, mm. I don't know who's exactly asking this or what their story is. I know that uh, I would say one thing I'd say to people at our church right now, I think if you see someone at the Sunday gathering who feels alone or no one uh, is talking to them, that should be code red for you. Take that responsibility on yourself. Sometimes as a pastor, I'd love to say to everyone at Trope Church, it's not just the pastors and staff members jobs to run around and go, oh, they look new or lonely. Like I'd love to greet them. We want to be the kind of church where if someone is standing alone, sitting alone, no one's talking to them, that should be code red for you. Leave your existing friends for a second and go start a conversation with someone that maybe doesn't have any friends or doesn't know. Because the church needs to work, especially as she grows, to be a friendly place. Yeah. Um, I also think, though, you got to step out, right? We all have to be a friend and not just kind of sit in our comfortable little little shells uh, or clicks, we got to reach out to each other. So we have to take initiative. It's kind of like a great marriage, honestly. Mm. When you decide to own your part of the equation and your wife does the same or your husband does the same, you start serving each other. In the church, when we start realizing there's someone that needs me to greet them, care for them, reach out to them, befriend them, and the person that feels alone starts to realize I need to be a friend, reach out and befriend, we start serving each other and closing that gap on isolation and loneliness. Fundamentally, um, why is community important to the faith? Um, because you're human. Mm -hmm. And God made it really clear in the beginning when he made Adam, it is not good for man to be alone. That's a marriage verse, but it's also a human verse. It's, it's this understanding that we were made for community, that the truth is we function um, at our highest when we're serving and being served. Mm -hmm. um, that's just the way we're made. And so... I mean, there's lots of evidence for that, even like secular evidence that they don't know how to put a spiritual framework to, that alienation and loneliness are significant um, enemies and culprits to a deteriorating uh, social and, and, and life, uh, social life in our in community, in, the, in our nation, in our world. Um, so yeah, I, I'm trying to think some other practical answers, how to, how to make friends and why is community so important to our faith? Um, I don't think you can become like Jesus efficiently on your own. Mm. I think you need, I think one of, one of the best definitions for discipleship I've ever heard before is truth transferred through relationship. Mm. Like discipling, being a disciple, disciple making is truth that we don't discover we receive. You don't mm -hmm. make your own, excuse me, I, I didn't say that right. Truth is something you discover. It's not something you develop. You don't make your own truth. That That's that's postmodernism. That's like, you know, no, 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 no. Truth by nature is something you discover. It's not something you devise. Yeah. So if that's true, 
which I believe it is, then truth transferred through relationship is the way we actually discover and become mm. aligned with truth. Mm. So community is exactly that. Mm. Truth flowing through relationship is how we become more like Christ. It's how we experience transformation. So community then is like a pivotal link in the chain. Mm. Uh, truth is objective. It is God himself. It is Christ, the Logos, the truth, the word, the plumb line. And if that way of being human, which Jesus showed as he walked this earth as God in the flesh, how do we get that in us? Mm. Well, we need to be iron sharpening iron together in community and relationships so that we can move towards that. And here's a part of why. So much of the way Jesus lived, the true uh, perfect example of God in the flesh, he did it by serving others, healing others, caring for others, challenging others. Um, so if, if we're going to be like him, we can't do it alone. Mm. We have others to serve and others that we need to be served by yeah. that call us out and yeah. say, you're missing the mark on this one. And we go, oh, I am. And then we repent and we confess and we grow and we are healed and we are changed. Yeah. Let's tie this back in to our very first question because I just think this is a beautiful place to kind of land the plane here. Okay. Is we have this opportunity to struggle together with the reality of where we are and where Christ is calling us into. It's it's an active invitation. And so one of the beautiful things we get to do as a family of Jesus followers is to care one another's burdens. Mm -hmm. And I I think right now more than ever, like we need that. Um, I think you have. Uh, you've, you've preached it before, but a few different ways we can approach carrying one another's burdens. Um, some of it falls onto our own hands as far as our own responsibility. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is this crazy call and important thing that is the brotherhood, the sisterhood of Christ of, of actually carrying someone else's burdens. And we even see it. If you were ever in Sunday school, we sang a song, Jesus, Jesus loves you. Mm -hmm. And that is the reminder to one another of the truth that we're all fighting for. And so let's, let's end it here. Let's yeah. talk about what it means to carry each other's burdens and encourage one another. Yeah. You know, like how do we, how do we carry each other? The Bible commands us to, to carry each other's burdens. As you already mentioned, that doesn't mean at the expense of carrying your own load. In fact, that section of instruction in Galatians 6, I preached on it recently, is explicit. Carry your own load, but also bear one another's burdens. Mm. How we do that, uh, I think, is we listen. We practice empathy. We enter into other people's story, other people's reality, other people's pain, other people's joy. And instead of making it about us, we do our best to make it about them and we listen, love, and serve them. I actually kind of want to practice it. This was not planned, but I think this I have an opportunity to do this. I don't know when people are going to see this podcast, but um, this week, uh, we're filming this on October 21st. Yep. Um, this week on October 18th, um, we had a vaccine mandate in the state of Washington that went into effect and there are people in Washington, people in my relational circle who've lost their jobs. Um, I've been really clear with my social circle. I've told our church I was vaccinated very early on. Um, I'm pro-vaccine. I think the vaccine is um, not a perfect tool. We've learned a lot about it since it's come out. Uh, but I think it's probably one of the best tools and it's a good tool. Not everyone should get it or take it and everyone should make that decision with their doctor. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I think it's a tough time where we have this mandate. Um, you know, there's lots of different opinions on that. Like, does the, should the government do that? You know, I think the government has a compelling interest in protecting its citizens, but man, it's sure hard to discern if this mandate is good or helpful. Okay. Let's take all that aside for a second. There's a lot of debate about that. There's people who think differently than what I just said. There's people who would agree with what I just said. There's people who would think what I just said doesn't go far enough uh, in as far as masking and, and vaccinations and everything related to COVID. Here is how we bear one another's burdens. Mm. I want to say to anyone watching this who has lost their job because of a very tough decision or a decision was made for them, or I want to say to someone who knows someone or is married to someone who's had uh, to go through this and, and, and is struggling and frustrated, even though I might not think about this issue the same way you do, here's how I can bear your burdens. I can say to you today, I want to pray for you 
because I want to enter into what I know is a, a crappy week for a bunch of people who are hurting and struggling. Mm-hmm. And that, that again, I'm using this as a pastoral example to a pertinent issue, yeah. but that's a perfect illustration. Can you disagree with someone about something and yet still see the image of God in them and properly locate your opinion on a subject where it belongs so that your disagreement doesn't cause you to wall off your heart from someone mm. so that you wouldn't serve them and love them. If you think, if you can't pray for your brother or sister in Christ who thinks about a mask mandate or a vaccine mandate different than you, and it causes anger and it causes division and distance and contempt for each other. How do you think you will live out Jesus's command to love your enemies? Mm. Church. So, so, so I want to model this. I'm not, we weren't, I, we did not plan this. Sorry. <laughs> I, I just it. came to my heart and maybe it's the spirit led thing. I just want to pray for every person in our, in our church community, yeah. in our community that are really struggling. I know, I know teachers, I know firefighters, I know uh, different people in different jobs that are really, really struggling. They're wondering how things are going to work. Um, and I also, I'll, I'll, I just want to, I just want to pray for us yeah, because I think yeah. this is what I guess I'm trying to say is this is how you bear each other's bear one another's yes. burdens. If, if care, if bearing someone's burden, um, requires them to think exactly the way I think, agree with me on everything I agree with, um, be in my super close friend group and be just the person I totally want to like love and serve and show empathy to. If, if, if that muscle is restricted to that small of a group, you are fooling yourself if you think you're actually bearing your brothers and sisters in Christ's burdens. Mm. You're not. It'll, you, you'll start to know you are when it's actually a little bit uncomfortable for mm. you. And if it's not uncomfortable, all you're doing is probably Project Self. You're probably caring for all the people who think just like you. And it's really easy for you. It's actually not, you're not actually carrying a burden. Or growing. No, you're not. You're, it's really comfortable. It's more like um, giving an inheritance to your kid. That's very different than giving some away, some of your wealth away to a stranger. Yeah. And so if we're going to carry burdens, it will come at some cost to us. Mm. And so I am burdened right now. I am burdened yeah. as, as a pastor and as a friend. I am burdened for people that I know who think even differently than me. Like, like my advice to people would be, unless you have significant medical reasons or whatever, I think you should get vaccinated. I, I personally wouldn't lose my job over this issue. But I, am, I feel mm. for people. Who, who are in pain and are hurting yes. and, and they're, they're worried and they're afraid. And I want them to know that I love them as their pastor and that I want to pray for them. Um, and that, amen. And here's another way. If I can, I want to help them yeah. navigate and be a part, be, 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 be with them relationally uh, in this scenario. So I want to conclude yeah. by praying yes, please. For, for our community and even for just, you know, things that we're all kind of nervous about that might be coming with, uh, supply chain shortages or labor shortages or all these things. Cause there's a lot happening. And so here's an example. So father, yeah. we come before you right now and I do pray. I pray for my friends. I pray for uh, those who've maybe lost their job or have stepped away from their job or have felt like this is just the worst possible scenario. I pray also for people who have lost a loved one to COVID and are stunned that I can even practice this kind of empathy and pray for someone who's unwilling to get a vaccine. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for your comfort, that you would come and comfort the, the, the hurting, the broken, the weary. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bring comfort, you would renew our hearts, you'd renew our strength that we would trust you, that you would uh, birth in us a trust of, of you, of your way, of your plan, of your picture for the future, that we would trust you with every day, not worrying too much about next week, but we would take it a day at a time. And we would, we would know that you're with us. I thank you for your comfort. I thank you for your guidance. I thank you, God, that you're our provider, even in challenging times like these. Uh, God, we just choose right now to, to, to care and share the burdens of our brothers and sisters. We choose to not allow preferences or differences of opinions on these matters. Uh, reduce us to those who will not still be known by our love mm. one for another. And Lord, we, we pray that you'd fill us with your spirit, 
Fill us with joy. Fill us with, with, with grace. Fill us with kindness and care and compassion for our fellow man. Help us to continue to exude the character of Christ, the attitude of Christ, and the fruit of the Spirit in the midst of a polarizing, divisive, contentious, and flagrant time. Lord, we ask you to keep our hearts steady on you, not the flavor of the week or the month or the political outrage or social outrage. May we be those who are grounded in faith, hope, and love, Mm. and those who look like and live like Jesus, especially to the household of faith. I'm just reminded of Lord your 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 scriptures. It, how will we have something to say to our watching world if we can't even pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ with whom we might not agree on even a, a, a secondary or tertiary issue like this? God, bind us together as your church. May the world know we're your disciples because of our love for one another. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.